great. Thanks everyone for coming today. My name is Sarah Truitt and I am the Director of Operations at uh, City of Sanctuary UK. I'm also the FE Colleges uh, of Sanctuary Stream Lead, which just means that over the last couple of years, in collaboration with my partners and colleagues here at City of Sanctuary and a whole range of colleges and um, City of Sanctuary group leads, we've been slowly developing the uh, FE Colleges of Sanctuary Stream. So today's session, we're going to be talking about what is a College of Sanctuary, the award process, how we work at City of Sanctuary UK, and a few different elements. Um, I'll probably talk, hopefully not too long, but uh, for 20, 25 minutes perhaps, then we can open it up and have a little bit of question and answer. I know there's some uh, fantastic Colleges of Sanctuary staff who are all, you know, in the space here with us today. So perhaps um, I can invite some of them towards the end to share a little bit from their experience. I would also like to encourage all of you to drop your name, where you are, and how you're sort of affiliated with either City of Sanctuary or what college you're from in the chat. Um, and feel free as I start my presentation to drop any questions or comments that you have into the chat. And my colleague, Megan, will pick them up and sort of in due course, uh, either stop me so I can answer them or we can take them all towards the end. But without further ado, I'm gonna share a little presentation I know some of you will be familiar with uh, many of the things I speak about today because you've been involved with either City of Sanctuary or, or maybe already recognized as a College of Sanctuary, but I know there are lots of new faces coming along um, for the first time. So we're trying to get, provide a kind of an overview, a little bit about City of Sanctuary as well as the, the award process. So thanks for being here and I will share my screen now. Hopefully you can see that. Okay, so I, I know I, many of you are very familiar with City of Sanctuary more generally, but this is just to sort of give a little bit of background and context. Uh, City of Sanctuary, it's all about trying to create a movement of welcome and belonging for people who have experienced forced displacement and have come to the UK seeking sanctuary. So um, I'll talk a little bit more in depth about you know, how we've evolved and, and what we're about as we go on. So today's session, uh, just briefly, I'm gonna give a little bit of an overview, as I've said, about City of Sanctuary, talk about what is a College of Sanctuary and why we feel this award is, is significant or important at this time. A little bit about the process. So for those of you who are quite new to this can understand a bit more about um, what you may want to do if you want to get involved and to be recognized. I know there are also some colleges on the call who have already um, either been recognized or have recently submitted applications. And so we're going to try and provide a little bit of context and feedback to um, the, how we develop this process, because it's fairly new, I would say, in the context of City of Sanctuary. And um, we've had a lot of interest over the last six months, which is lovely, but we also have very limited capacity. So hopefully in talking about uh, what we've been doing and what we're trying to put in place will help explain a little bit where we are and, and, and how we can respond. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about some of the other resources that exist and training opportunities and partnerships that we're working on. Um, so I'm really pleased to see some colleagues come along here today from um, Refugee Education UK. Um, and then we'll have a sort of open interactive session toward the end where I'd welcome anyone to ask questions, offer comments, and in particular, if you are at an FE college um, and want to know more, uh, that's a great place to ask questions. Okay, so I... I, you know, we're going to aim to stick to the sort of one hour time slot. So I won't provide a huge in-depth background about City of Sanctuary, but I do think it's always helpful for those of you who are entirely new to working with our organization to understand a little bit about City of Sanctuary. So the City of Sanctuary concept developed back in 2005. Um, you'll see it here uh, pictured our two sort of founding fathers, as it were. Uh, the Dr. Reverend Indigit Vogel and Craig Barnett. And, and, and they essentially had a vision of trying to help Sheffield become not just a place that provided good services and support to new arrivals, but also became a much more welcoming city across the city. So they sort of had a broader vision of not just um, uh, that, that it wouldn't just be people providing things to and for uh, refugees and asylum seekers, but that actually the wider community would it's Self start to think about how it can become welcoming. Um, we've evolved significantly since that time, um, as you can imagine, and what started off in Sheffield has quickly grown across the UK. 
I would say that we focus mainly on trying to raise awareness, um, uh, develop plans of action in different communities, reflecting what is um, the experience of new arrivals in particular communities. And we also do a lot of advocacy to try and promote uh, better conditions and a better situation for refugees and asylum seekers. Because we've grown so quickly over time, um, there was a felt to be a need back in 2014, 15, uh, to kind of consolidate what we were about at City Sanctuary UK and how we would work as an umbrella organization. And you can read all about that in our City of Sanctuary Charter. I won't go into depth about it, but we looked, we talked about things like our values, which are around inclusion, uh, participation, working with positivity, and trying to um, create opportunities for lots of mainstream organizations like educational institutions, including FE colleges, to find ways to offer welcome. Uh, so in broad terms, City of Sanctuary has kind of evolved over time. We have kind of three elements to us. We have uh, a small umbrella organization, which I'm part of, that's Citizens, uh, City of Sanctuary UK. Uh, there's about 12 of us, most of whom work part-time. I think we have two full-time staff out of uh, a, a team of 14. So I just to kind of want to underscore that we are a very small organization uh, in terms of the number of hours we work. We all work from home and across the UK. Um, so I'm based in Yorkshire. My colleague Megan, who's on the call, is, is based in the Midlands. And we have colleagues in places like Scotland, London, et cetera. Um, our remit is principally around fo uh, focusing uh, uh, and offering support to a network of about 123 active city of sanctuary groups across the UK. Those groups, so as I mentioned, you know, what started in Sheffield, that idea of welcome became quite powerful for um, and interesting for other places. And over time, we've slowly added more and more uh, groups to the network. Um, so these groups all are tremendously unique um, in, in, in terms of what they do to offer welcome. Some are offering frontline support services, running drop-ins, working day-to-day -day with asylum seekers. Other um, groups within the network are actually uh, doing posting opportunities or might be doing awareness raising. In every case, they try and look at what are the specific needs of new arrivals in their community and address that, and also provide a collaborative uh, focal point to bring together different organizations. Um, and I should say that we sort of see ourselves as part of a broader movement. We work really closely uh, with a whole range of other refugee sector actors and partners. I'll talk in particular today about some of our educational space uh, partner organizations. But we really see ourselves as, as being connected and part of, and we want to extend the work of all of the wonderful uh, organizations that are working to support new arrivals. So that's a little bit about what City of Sanctuary UK is. Um, I should also probably hold up and share, if, if you want to learn more about sort of the growth and the development in the early days of the City of Sanctuary movement, there's a fantastic book. Um, which is called uh, 100,000 Welcome. And uh, one of our colleagues put it together uh, to talk about those early days. So how we really transitioned from being uh, starting off in Sheffield and then becoming a network of so many groups. And it has some really beautiful, powerful stories of individuals uh, offering welcome. So, but what we're here today to talk about is um, FE Colleges of Sanctuary. And um, so what is that? And, and what does that really mean in tangible terms? Um, so I think it's really important for you to share what we have as sort of our vision for all of the places uh, of sanctuary that get recognized uh, with and through us. In particular, an FE College of Sanctuary, we principally see it as a place where everyone on the campus feels welcome and safe. We see it as a place where there are, um, there are opportunities to learn about why so many people have been forcibly displaced. Uh, we want it to make sure that in it's not just about, say, refugee students, or it's not just about the faculty knowing more, but it's really about a whole community at the college understanding what happens and why people have been pushed on the move. It's also a place that recognizes that, um, you know, while people may be coming because they've been forcibly displaced or had to leave their home, they actually come with, uh, they come to the UK with a whole range of skills. Um, they come with, and they, in, and, and their present act, presence actually enriches all of us in our communities, in our schools, allowing us to, to meet new cultures, learn new languages, um, and, and show kind of a, a, a greater recognition of the fact that, um, the UK 
and actually this island has seen uh, patterns of migrations for thousands of years and that uh, were all enhanced by the fact that new arrivals contribute to our communities. And we also hope that an uh, FE College of Sanctuary is one that allows all students, particularly those from a forced displacement background, to feel supported in their educational journey so that they, their needs are recognized and they are given the tools and support they need to, to, to be included. So why is this necessary and why at this particular time um, are we focusing on this? Well, I think probably most of you will be very familiar with, uh, you know, the global context that we're working in and, you know, watching the daily news will, you will no doubt be aware that this, at this particular point in time, uh, we are seeing a huge number of people being forcibly displaced, people who are on the move, fleeing conflict and persecution. Um, this sadly uh, is probably the highest point of, of mass displacement that we've seen since the end of the Second World War. Uh, UNHCR's estimates from June of this past year is that, uh, or sorry, the numbers from June, uh, when I went to go look at the slide um, to update and present for today, obviously I had to update them because in June, uh, the, the figures from the, U, the UN had said that there were about 86 million people who had been forcibly displaced. But that hadn't started to take into account all the figures that have come from Ukraine. And so what we've seen now is that there's nearly a, a hundred million people who've been forcibly displaced. Um, so it's a, a vast number, as you can imagine, and people are on the move for a variety of different reasons. So it's really important, we think, to help um, all of us, particularly young people and, and people who are in the educational context, to understand what's happening in the global space. Uh, I also think another reason we feel like it's incredibly important is obviously there's a huge focus within our uh, national government on migration, immigration, asylum seeking. Um, as many of you will be aware, the government has pursued what it calls the hostile environment, um, which means that there are a whole host of uh, policies and uh, approach, governmental approaches to try and uh, make it incredibly difficult for people to settle and uh, find sanctuary here in the UK. And we think it's really important through all of our streams, but in particular as well in, with FE Colleges, is to kind of highlight some of the um, inaccurate rhetoric that we see coming, not just from our government, but from also the popular press. Um, we think that FE Colleges of Sanctuary can help really contribute to, to, to local communities around cohesion. I think we believe that in raising awareness about why people are on the move, uh, there'll be greater understanding and empathy and, and perhaps then allow for um, more supportive services to be developed. So we think that can be really play a role. I mean, FE Colleges sit at the heart of so many of our communities. And finally, we think FE Colleges as a sanctuary is, is important at that individual student level. We hope that as FE Colleges go through the process of reflecting on what they do and how they um, offer welcome, that they can find ways to really support and better improve the outcomes for individual learners. So how has this developed over the last couple of years? Um, as many of you will be aware, we have had a schools of sanctuary uh, stream of work uh, within City of Sanctuary UK for over 10 years now, and it's been evolving, you know, sort of in fits and starts. And over the last two years in, in particular, it's taken on a huge momentum, which is lovely to see. Um, we also at the same time have been developing our universities of sanctuary work, and we recognize that there was sort of a gap in terms of um, uh, of that provision. And, and also in beginning to talk with partners and city of sanctuary groups, we realized that for so many young people, FE colleges is really an, an a crucial first site where so many of them go to learn English and develop pathways into employment or into higher education. And so we felt like it was important for us to consider this and, and invest a little bit of time thinking about how we might engage with FE colleges. Uh, one of our first awards was, was uh, it's given to Preston College in Lancashire, and that was in recognition, recognition of some really fantastic efforts they made to support individual learners, as well as support they've provided to things like our sanctuary and politics course. We've also, um, the Association of Colleges reached out to me, and we had some really fruitful conversations. And over the last two years, that in conjunction with some of the sort of pioneering vanguard FE Colleges of Sanctuary have made us realize um, just how much opportunity there is in this space. So I, I wanted just to take a moment and kind of reflect a little bit um, for those of you that are coming from Epi Colleges to think about um, what it might be like 
for those individual learners arriving onto your campuses and what they might be experiencing. Just to keep in mind as we think about what what poss possible changes or policies or approaches that could be taken to help make their experience and transition to further education easier. So, you know, clearly, as I think any of us can imagine, if you're separated or had to flee your homeland, you're going to be missing your family and your friends and the familiar culture and language that you've always experienced. Um, that never changes. Uh, you know, you, there's always going to be a, a sense of, of, of longing for something that you're missing. So I think it's important to kind of keep that in mind. Obviously, if you're arriving into the UK, well, you may have arrived as a refugee and your um, situation and status is uh, settled. And so you may not be, you know, in, in limbo, but you still may have gone through a process by which you don't, um, you haven't had much agency. If you're a, a new arrival who's still in the asylum process and still waiting on your claim to be adjudicated by the Home Office, you're in a particularly long state of limbo. Um, most, you know, it can take upwards of several years for people's claims to be resolved. And while you're waiting for that decision for the Home Office, it's very difficult to plan, know what's going to happen next. So you can imagine as an individual how um, disempowering that is to not know when and if you're going to be able to rebuild your life here in the UK. Obviously, if you're fleeing a war, persecution, you may have experienced trauma or violence. And that's obviously something that, you know, many individuals carry with them. Um, you know, they, they may have financial concerns. For those, many of you will be aware that obviously if you're in the asylum system, there's a very low level of support provided um, while you're going through that process. Individuals basically live on about six pounds a day. And so the cost of um, the either being able to, you know, plan for the future or cover toiletry costs or, or clothing costs can be really difficult and it can cause huge financial stress and strain. Um, I should say, if, if you're not aware, obviously, when you're in the asylum process, uh, individuals aren't allowed to work. They're, they're barred from working. So there's no opportunity for them to, you know, control their financial situation or improve it. They're just, they're simply reliant on those, uh, the funding they get from the home office. Sometimes they experience, very sadly, hate crimes, discrimination, things like that in their communities. And that's certainly something that we hope both through the work that we do more broadly with City of Sanctuary, but also at, at the FE College level, is, is a real role that um, institutions like yours can, can play in improving, uh, you know, to countering uh, that kind of racism, offering welcome, help educate people so that there isn't, um, there's probably less opportunity for those in instances to occur. Um, I just wanted to reference, and we'll talk a little bit more about this probably later and, and, and during the discussion session, but obviously, for individuals from these backgrounds, there do exist a whole range of barriers to education. Um, I reference the fact that, you know, people may be here with uncertain immigration status. So the, their ability to access um, college or to, to, to go into higher education might be limited um, and, and what they can do can be constrained in terms of what they can turn access for funding or finances. So that can be really limiting. I think almost what's more limiting sometimes, though, is the fact that there's so little information and uh, for some of these young people to understand how they can access uh, education and what may exist in their communities. We know that obviously, like so many institutions across our communities, um, you know, there have been significant funding cuts over the last 10 years and there are many constraints uh, upon institutions uh, around funding and budgeting. But it's it's trying to find those opportunities and those as sources of, of bursaries of, or funds that help allow people. And unfortunately, I think for a lot of people who've experienced forced displacement, they may not know where to go or how to access that information. And so what we're trying to do in a small way in working with FE colleges is, is to try and help um, make access to that information more more help uh, more res readily accessible. Another thing I just think is important to remember, and we talked about some of the things that. Uh, people who've experienced forced displacement might have experienced is that, you know, uh, obviously one's mental health and emotional well-being can really impact one's capacity to, to, to engage with school, to be, feel uh, able to participate, to even just sort of physically get yourself to the school. So uh, it's just something to kind of keep in mind. Um, I know I have some wonderful colleagues from the Refugee Education UK team on the line. Um, they have done some fantastic research reports 
outlining in greater depth some of these barriers to education, which I really recommend folks take a look at so you can think through how your college may um, be able to address some of them. So just to kind of give you some hopeful ideas about what FE colleges do provide students who are from these backgrounds. Um, obviously, just, you know, kind of a range of the obvious things that you would think, you know, going and being in education can help uh, provide a bit of structure and opportunity and routine for people who, you know, as I've mentioned, can often feel uh, lacking in agency and not having control over their days and times. But, you know, giving, being, attending classes, learning ESOL is, 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 a, is a great way to give them a framework. It helps them to meet people, practice their English, learn some skills. It helps give them some ideas about their future direction and where they might be going. Um, so, you know, FA colleges have a lot, uh, can provide a really important site of support and welcome. Specifically though, what, what are things like FA colleges um, can do to promote welcome? Um, and this will segue kind of neatly into the way uh, we recognize and offer awards. So some of the things that we, uh, you know, think FE colleges can do is 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 to reflect on the training and the support they provide to the faculty and staff team, as well as the wider students around issues related to asylum, migration, um, and sanctuary seeking. Uh, I would say that we know that there's a bit of a gap in um, in some of this space, and so I'll I'll talk about it in depth a little bit later on. But we are looking and talking with one of our partner organizations about developing some uh, opportunities for colleges around training to help uh, address some of those questions, because we know it is a complex field uh, around understanding all the restrictions and, and, and uh, funding opportunities that exist. We encourage FE colleges to think through their own policies. What do they have in place? Things that may need specific reference to those uh, from a sanctuary seeking background. We also really encourage colleges to think about identifying either staff person, staff team that is kind of responsible for this area of work. I know a lot of colleges have inclusion officers or people who work specifically on diversity, and it's a, that might be a great locus site, but it's kind of making sure that there's someone in the college that is aware of this and owns this process of, of, of offering welcome. There's lots of things you can do in partnership with local refugee supporting organizations, and we really encourage you if there is a local city of sanctuary group nearby to be in touch with them, um, as well as, you know, there's a whole host of other organizations that may be doing offering hosting or doing running drop-ins or providing some direct services. Maybe reach out to those organizations and see what you can do. Um, and then there's also lots of celebratory and uh, learning opportunities around uh, raising awareness about why people become refugees, why they come to the UK. So obviously there's the annual Refugee Week, uh, which takes place in June, which is another great site or a great opportunity for people um, on campuses to, to share, have film nights, host talks, host walks, host you know, activities to bring students together. What's really been lovely in, in the work we've been doing over the last you know, year and a bit on this is that we've gotten so many case studies through some of the uh, now Colleges of Sanctuary of all the things that you can do. And I think I should say, and it's really important both here and now, is just to reflect that obviously every college will have a different uh, community of students, have different needs. So our, our intent is to try and you know, think about what makes sense in your context. What can you do that makes sense for your students and your community? So we don't expect every college to do every single thing in the same way. So just a couple examples from the network. Um, and I, as I said, I know there are a few people on the call who are um, from Colleges of Sanctuary. So hopefully at the end, people can share a little bit from their own experience if they fancy. But, um, you know, the, uh, there's some really wonderful examples. Eastley College, which is one of our more recent Colleges of Sanctuary, they had a redesign of their Learners Hub, which has allowed it and made it much more easily and accessible for new arrivals to get the information they need by passing them you know, everyone's in a physical open space and the students can come together. And uh, if there is an issue, you know, it can be quickly resolved between different staff. So it's something about thinking about physical spaces and what works in terms of quickly assuring students of, of the support they can, they need to access and, and, and directing them to. Um, Hale Zoe and College, you can see here on the, these, some of these lovely photos. Um, 
they, last spring in support of the Together with Refugees Coalition actions with Orange Heart. You know, they did a kind of a uh, two-step thing where they had a, a, a crafting act well-being activity which brought people together to talk and do crafts and then they put those orange hearts around the campus which symbolize a welcome um, and support for refugees um there's a, you know an example here from there's a picture here from harrogate college when they got their award uh, i think this is from one of their refugee week activities which was a movie night where they brought people together to to watch movie uh, watch a movie about forced displacement and talk about it and so to help educate the wider um, uh, community about refugee issues. Um, Sheffield College, I hope you're on the line, I haven't seen you, but um, another fantastic example of how they, um, in response to all the new arrivals that have come from Ukraine and then Afghanistan over the last year, they've been able to develop creative short-term modules to help students immediately get some initial support while they wait for the next opportunity to register for either ESOL courses or other learning. So it's about colleges finding interesting, flexible ways to, um, to, 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 to respond to needs that they identify with on, uh, on their campus. So I know many of you are here curious to find out about how to be recognized as a College of Sanctuary. Essentially, all of the Sanctuary Awards that we um, offer at City of Sanctuary UK follow the same set of processes. We call it our learn, embed, and share model. And essentially what we're hoping is that every institution that, you know, big or small, whether it's the FE College or a cafe or a art gallery the size of the Baltic in the Northeast or, um, you know, a, a school in a, a small village or a big city roughly follows the same set of procedures. One is about learning, learning what it means to seek sanctuary learning what it means, uh, what some of the terminology is, making sure that, that people recognize the difference uh, between being a, a asylum seeker and a refugee and understand that there are certain implications with that. Understanding um, that perhaps the process isn't as easy as might be uh, explained in our popular press, but actually it's a very difficult, traumatic process to seek asylum in the UK. Um, we then hope that, that from that learning uh, about what is the, the true experience of, of people with lived of, of being forcibly displaced, that institutions reflect on their policies and their activities and what is it that they do and what is it that they can offer to allow for uh, change in their institutions. So that's about embedding policies and changes and different practices of support. So it can be as simple as, as you know, um, reviewing um, in the context of say an art gallery, making sure that you have uh, offering discounted or free tickets to um, your local refugee supporting organization to allow them to come and visit this on a regular basis. It's about looking about what activities you're doing and if there might be a need to um, offer interpretation so people can access those services. You know, it's about really thinking through what makes sense, what can we do, how does this offer welcome, and how are we going to be able to sustain it for the long haul. And then lastly, and hopefully the most positive part uh, for everyone, is that sharing of what's been done. Um, we really value in all of our networks the generosity with which a lot of our awarded institutions uh, bring back. So sort of the expectation is that as you're going through it, uh, an award application, you're one sharing that with your in the wider institution within your community, having uh, uh, reaching out to perhaps on your social media, even talking to local media outlets about the work that you're doing because you believe in offering that welcome, but also offering um, your your institution as an example that you can share in in our networks, in our case studies, on our website. Um, and trying to offer opportunities to share between colleges. I know that some of the colleges on, on perhaps even here today um, have reached out to each other to share and, and learn from each other's experience of, of, of offering welcome. And that's really what we really wanna see because for us, part of that sharing element is about extending good practice and, and, and helping other colleges think creatively about what they can do. So specifically to get, a, um, to get an award, as I mentioned at the start, it's really important to recognize that every college is different, and we recognize that. We know that there are some colleges that have very small numbers of new arrivals. 
um, whereas, uh, or may it may only be something that they've recently expanded into having an e-cell department or something like that. We know there are other places that have been effectively working with large numbers of new arrivals for, you know, many, many, many years, and so have a fantastic body of experience and practice to draw on. Uh, so we don't expect every school to be the same. We have outlined a set of 12 criteria, each of which are sort of um, held under each the, those wider processes. So we have a couple learn criteria, and that relates to training and learning edu opportunities. We have embed, which looks at how colleges can embed them. I didn't want today's session to go into detail into every single criteria. It is available on our website and in the resource pack, the, the image of which you can see here. And, and if you can go online, you can either download, we have a PDF file online and we also are now printing hard copies. So if you're keen for hard copies, we can send them out for you. But the important thing is to think about, you know, what makes sense in your context and, and if there are gaps in what you can do in terms of meeting the criteria, we have tried to set out different ways that you could potentially address them. Uh, we expect for every institution that wants to get it to complete an application form, um, which is also on our website. I'll hold it up here if you can see me in the corner of your picture, but this is it, it's sort of a Word document that's easily downloadable. And what we usually suggest is that if you're thinking about becoming a, a College of Sanctuary, if you think this might be something that's of interest to you, um, to download that award, talk to obviously colleagues across your college that you wanna work with on it. Typically we encourage them to put it on an internal shared drive where you can start to immediately document. Cause I know there will be colleges joining us here today that are already doing a range of things that would meet the criteria and represent really wonderful welcoming practices. Um, so using that, application form to start to document how it is that you're offering welcome. We also encourage colleges to think about then setting up a sort of corollary Google Drive where you can just start to drop in as you do activities, um, the evidence for it. So it makes it easier, uh, it, you know, when you get to the point where you feel ready to submit an application. Um, and and we reckon, we, 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 what we recommend generally is that having that shared drive is an easy space where you can kind of, you know, drop in information and, and hopefully, because one of the challenges we've, we've noted with awards more generally is that often, and we love this because there are sanctuary champions within institutions who really want to promote um, this activity, who drive forward uh, the effort within an institution. However, if it's not put in a collaborative format that allows the wider uh, institution staff to get involved, it sometimes can be far too focused on a single individual. So we really encourage any of you who are contemplating this, if you're that sanctuary champion, think about how you can broaden it out and include others because um, we don't want it to become too onerous or too burdensome for a single individual in an institution, as well as we think it's really important that there's a whole organizational approach. Um, we always encourage creativity and, and, you know, like I said, we don't expect, um, none of our applications to date have been, uh, identical and we really don't want to see that in, you know, that's not what we're looking for. We're, we're not looking for tick box exercise. Um, I should say that because we've had such enormous growth over the last, particularly six months, I would say, but, you know, over the last year and a half as we've been developing the resource pack and trying to create capacity, we, um, have had an, a huge number of interest, a huge amount of interest, which is really great and, and says to us that there is space and interest in, in trying to promote good practice at the FE college level. However, because of that, to help us at City of Sanctuary UK support that growth through events like this and the resource pack and reviewing and applications, we have set up a small fee and it's a 450 pound fee and that is to cover the sort of three year lifespan of an award. We give awards, uh, you know, that sort of last for three years, after which point there's sort of a reaccreditation um, process. And that's in part because we think it's really important that this becomes sort of a living um, process for colleges. So it's not just something that you do once and then it's done and you move on from that. And if that, you know, if, 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 if that is your approach, then maybe this might not be the right award for you. But what we really hope for all the colleges is that they continue to get involved and, and this is something that they want to refresh and, and get reaccredited on.
Um, so how do you get started? Um, I, it's great that you're all here today. <laughs> That's an excellent first start. I know some of you have already completed this journey, so it's wonderful to see you coming back and, and being willing to share um, uh, and, and attend today's session. The first and easiest step, as with all our awards, is to pledge your commitment to work to the values and principles. And that's by simply signing a pledge. I'm hoping my colleague Megan will drop into the chat and we will forward all these materials after the session. But um, just to say, so the easiest first step is we ask all institutions to sign up or pledge or support to creating a, a place of welcome in the UK. And um, that, how, that initial step is a great way to let us know that you're interested. And then we find out where you are and um, we can connect you with your local groups. So we have a mailing list. Um, we aim to send out uh, newsletters every month. I think many of you will have seen the most recent one I did a few days ago because I had a number of signups for this event after it. In that newsletter, I try and highlight upcoming events that we're hosting that everyone's welcome to, um, any interesting reports or training opportunities from other organizations, things like that. Uh, we have a, 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 so please do join that mailing list and you'll you know, be updated regularly. I'm hoping Megan again can drop in the chat the link to that. I think the other thing to do, if you haven't, uh, if, if this is all fairly new to you and you, you, you know, you really are beginning your journey of becoming an SE college, is to start thinking about what is it you're already doing. I know many of you will, um, particularly if you have large ESOL departments, you'll, you know, you might have been very active considering the needs and uh, for your refugee students. So it's about kind of assessing that. Um, I just wanted to share um, that Megan uh, and, and I, we've been working on, um, it's an audit tool, so I don't know if you can see this, but we'll be sharing this later in the week with a follow-up for this. And it's essentially a fairly detailed uh, checklist of different things across all the criteria. Uh, as suggestions for points that you can think about in terms of approaching um, your sanctuary award. It's not a requirement for you to do this, to, to, to um, be, you know, to complete the application and get recognized, but it is hopefully something that will give you an opportunity to reflect and hopefully uh, across different areas of your work around what could, what could, what could be done and what could then be applicable in your application when when and if you go to that step. Um, we have the resource pack, as I mentioned, it's available currently now as a PDF online, but um, it is going to print this week as well. So if you're interested in getting some hard copies to share or bring to your colleagues, um, it's full of some really lovely examples and case studies. I'd also encourage you to think about signing up for some training sessions, and I'll talk more about that in a second. But um, obviously in talking with colleges, we do know, and, and based on some of the queries we're getting, there are a lot of, it is, it, there are lots of questions people have about um, this space. And so we have uh, been thinking about ways to offer more support and training. So here's some dates for the diary and, 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 and talking about those training. As I mentioned, we have been in discussions with Refugee Education UK about um, helping expand uh, opportunities for people to learn about uh, what might be the particular needs of, of students coming from a forced migration background. So we have put together um, these trainings. We, they will come with a fee. Um, and uh, we have set up the, this to launch in January of 2023. Uh, we have a couple different sets of, of themes. The, the initial ones you'll see up here are sort of introductions. And those will be overviews and sort of detailed offerings around trying to put in context what's happening in um, the national context around government policy, but also what are the particular needs of people with um, the lived experience of being forcibly displaced. We would, in all of these sessions, we'll be hearing with those with lived experience talking about, you know, what the, what, what they have um, gone through in their effort to, to join education. So we have some upcoming training. We also, in order, because we've had such tremendous um, interest in the stream over the last six months particularly, and I think it's a reflection of, of what's happening in the global context and the fact that there are, for example, you know, large numbers of Ukrainians arriving into communities. Um, because we've had so many applications um, over the summer, we received four or five maybe that, you know, some from colleges that we hadn't uh, even known were planning to apply. 
what we've tried to do is to create a, a plan and structure for the next uh, academic year to kind of help Megan and I to be able to be more responsive. And I will say, I know there are a couple of colleges online who have applied and are still waiting for the next step. And, and I, were, I assure you that we will be in touch very soon. It's just been a tremendously busy time for us as we've tried to um, create a structure to allow us to, to, to more quickly process these applications. Now, the one thing I wanted to kind of highlight in this is that, as I mentioned, we have about 123 city of sanctuary local groups across the UK. And we also have a network of about 50 um, schools of sanctuary local leads. So those are individuals who are committed and signed up to help us implement our schools of sanctuary project, which is fantastic. Um, some of those individuals in some places will be helping us with colleges. So there will be some local support. However, because we don't have quite as many uh, local leads for colleges in the same way that we have for our schools of sanctuary, um, any applications that don't have a local group or a local lead that works for them will be coming to Megan and I to be developed and run through the uh, appraisal process. And that's part of why we've tried to create this schedule of support um, in order to kind of help, hopefully help um, colleges direct their activities and, and, and give you timelines to work towards. I think the important thing to say is we are so um, delighted that so many people want to learn more and be recognized for their efforts. And we really encourage you to, um, we're, we're so pleased about that. I would just say that I hope no institution feels a rush to do this. And if you feel like these deadlines that we've kind of popped up on the stage, you know, letting us know about whether you want to be applied this year, submitting initial application in January, a final one by March, if those aren't gonna be doable for you, that doesn't mean that you can't get involved, attend our activities and think about doing this for next academic year. It's, it's simply so that we can process them in a sort of timely fashion um, and be more responsive. So I hope that's clear. I can see there's a whole lot of chats that I'm missing. So um, I look forward to answering questions in a minute and I'm sure you're tired of my voice. <laughs> so thanks for your patience thus far. I just wanted to highlight a couple things that we are working on and um, to, you know, how we're planning to further this stream. Uh, in particular, um, I've mentioned that we will be launching the audit tool, as I showed you earlier. Um, hopefully, again, we'll be sending that out later in the week. And so that hopefully can be, again, that in conjunction with the resource pack um, and, and some of the case studies and things on our website should hopefully give you some examples and tools to get you started. Um, I have been speaking to a couple of colleges, a couple of colleges in our network, and I know that there seems to be a real interest and in support for providing sort of informal peer-to-peer -peer networking opportunities, particularly in the regions. As I mentioned, I'm based in Yorkshire, and I know I've spoken to a couple of the Yorkshire colleges, those some of those that have been awarded and some of those that have, are still in the process of, of, of being recognized. Um, so we're thinking about, you know, just informal lunchtime opportunities where if you're working or, you know, on supporting sanctuary seeking students or you want to ask questions, we can come together for an hour, you know, and, and, and sort of just chat about what we're doing and what kind of regional connections might be made. Um, Megan and I are also working up on some thematic webinars. Uh, we know that it, with our schools of sanctuary project, a lot of people have been interested in tracking, learning about how to take a trauma-informed approach to pedagogy, for example. And we know that there's some great learning that's taking place in the FE space. So we're looking to do webinars on that. We're looking at, you know, um, some other themes. So I'd really encourage you, if there are topics of interest that you have or things that you know you'd like to see, uh, to learn more about, please reach out to us and let us know so that we can try and find appropriate speakers or resources and maybe put on some webinars. Um, another element is that we are hoping to um, uh, link a little bit more closely to our sister program of the Universities of Sanctuary. As many of you will know, there's probably about, I, I checked the latest list, I think it's 23 universities that have been recognized. Um, and we know in certain parts of the country, FE colleges are working quite closely uh, with their local universities to help students transition. Uh, we know that isn't always possible, um, but, you know, we're looking at ways in which we can, you know, better foster connections and collaboration, both within communities, but then sort of across the country. So I guess the question at the end of the slide um, is hopefully, you know, what help might, what, you know, what would be of help to you as you think about what you would need to support sanctuary seekers on your campus? 
Um, and I think, yeah, this is the last slide, and then we can open up for discussion. Um, and I just, I'm, I just ending with a little quote. I'm sure you can all read this. This is from a, a, a colleague and sanctuary ambassador, friend of ours. He's also really active in our T's Valley of Sanctuary group, talking about the importance of college to him as someone coming from um, a, a background of seeking sanctuary and how it helped him. And I should say he's now at university uh, studying for an advanced degree. And so being in college really helped shape and allow him to kind of progress in his studies. So I hope just to draw it back, and the reason that we're here today is to um, help colleges uh, offer those kind of opportunities to more and more students. So I think I'm going to stop this slideshow now, uh, take a drink of water, uh, check out the chat and see what kind of questions are coming in. And hopefully, uh, Megan, you've been able to collate some of those. I hope this has been a little bit of a rushed over uh, uh, review, but hopefully this gives you a little bit of sense of, of what to, uh, of, of what FE Colleges is about, and um, and then we can talk a little more. So, thank you. Okay. So, I'm just pulling up the chat. Okay, there's about 40 messages I've mixed. So I'm going to ask Megan, perhaps, if you could. Um, Okay, great. Thank you, Megan. So one of the things, what are the differences between schools and colleges criteria? So this is good. And I probably should have said this at the very beginning. When we're talking about colleges of sanctuary in this context, we've been mainly talking about FE colleges, further education colleges. Sixth form colleges, we generally um, assess them under our schools of sanctuary criteria. So our schools of sanctuary criteria are slightly fewer in number. Uh, there's about eight to them, um, and hopefully Megan can drop into the chat as well a link to our resource packs on schools of sanctuary. But essentially, what we've done with all of our institutions is, as the, the bigger the institution, sort of more complex it is, we've tried to create criteria that reflect that increased complexity and make that, you know, the expectation that there's a little bit more work done. Um, so, you know, in particular, to to, to, to colleges, it's about making sure that there are appropriate um, transitions points, that you know, there's the, enough training. So if you're here from a sixth form college, the best, uh, you really should be reviewing the Schools of Sanctuary resource pack. And we welcome you to our webinar next week, which will be on the 11th, where we'll go over the Schools of Sanctuary process in greater depth. Um, but that they are, yes, yeah, slightly different but that essentially we have that same model that I've been talking about, that there's learning, there's embedding, and that there's sharing. Um, great. Oh, we are a bit of both, okay. Both FE and Sixth Form College, in which case, in that instance, I would sort of say, take the FE College um, uh, approach because, you know, uh, we want to see that little bit more, um, uh, you know, that in that instance. Um, is there a central list of local universities? I would say, I don't know that we have them divided down into regions, but we do have a list of our colleges, our universities of sanctuary, which is available on our website, on our universities page. Um, Megan may be able to drop that in the chat. I know she's busy fielding a few things, but we can absolutely, um, and, there, and I should also mention there's, within the universities of sanctuary, uh, we have a DISC list, which is a um, informal mailing group where universities kind of talk to each other about, you know, setting up sanctuary scholarships, understanding the rules around admissions, you know, all those kinds of tricky things. Um, and so that's a, that's a space that you're welcome to join as an FE college to see what the uh, universities are talking about. But it is something that we've been thinking about whether it's appropriate or would be useful. And it's something I'm sort of throwing out there. Maybe you can throw in your thoughts in the chat or share with them um, is, is, you know, whether there should be a, a similar GISC list where FE colleges can talk to each other and, and, and offer support to each other. Um, is, that, is, the, is the network active in Northern Ireland? Yes, we do have a College of Sanctuary in Northern Ireland. Belfast Met uh, received the award a couple of years ago and we'll be going through the reaccreditation process. So I absolutely will link you um, uh, to Leisha. I don't know if you're on the call today. I think we have uh, 
uh, a colleague from Belfast Hospital who's going to try and join us today. I don't know if she's here. I can't quite see on the screen. But if you are here, feel free to raise your hand and share. Um, yes. Oh, I see a thumbs up from Megan. And I do know, I, I think I do owe you, uh, I have an outstanding email from, from you. Okay. Um, oh, yes, great. Someone has, uh, Lucia has dropped in the chat the, um, the link to the Belfast City of Sanctuary website, which kind of shares. Um, great. I'm glad people making connections in the chat. Okay. Uh, just making sure I haven't missed another question. No, Megan's shaking your head no, which is always good. Um, all right. Since I've heard myself talk a lot, I, I'm, I am wondering if there's anyone, um, uh, you know, either from our network, perhaps one of the groups talk about, you know, what they, uh, how they've been working with awards, or if there's any of our um, uh, colleges that have been recognized that feel like they want, might want to share from their own experience, either of getting the award or what led them to do that. Um, I'd really welcome it. And, or maybe even to put some colleagues from Refugee Education UK on the spot to maybe share a little bit about the work that they do as an organization, because I think so many of the queries and activities we get um, often are things that might be uh, something that they can support with. Okay. Well, um, okay, we built in a fair bit of time to have some interaction and discussion, but I obviously I know people are very busy um, and I, I, I hope some of this has been very clear. Yeah. Um, if there's anyone who wants to offer or ask any questions, or Megan, maybe I'll ask you, is there anything that I've forgotten? to mention in our my presentation um no nothing to um that i would i would stress i mean the only thing is commenting on and nikki's comment in the in the chat i think the thing is is that we're so often see such amazing practice in the ESOL department and what we hope from the fe colleges award is that it's a real opportunity for the ESOL department to kind of shine a light on the fantastic stuff they're doing for the rest of the people um, in the college and also to kind of work to extend that beyond the ESL department and um, making sure that lots of other um, uh, teachers and, and other members of staff um, know exactly about the challenges facing students from sanctuary seeking backgrounds. For example, we've seen some recent stories of um, you know, students going into carpentry courses and um, their tutor within the carpentry course saying, well, I really don't know much about their experiences and what challenges they might be facing. And obviously having some background on that will really help that, that tutor in being able to effectively support them and meet their needs in a kind of informed way. Um, I know that Ligia has got her hand up and then we've got one more question in the chat. And um, so maybe we can go to Ligia now. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you, Megan. Um, just very quickly. Uh, I apologize, my, my voice is coming through not very well. I've, I've been I'm on the other end of COVID. But um, just want to say that uh, being a College of Sanctuary, uh, and I'm from the Belfast Met in, in, in Northern Ireland, um, has been a process and it, it continues to be a process. It's not something that you achieve um, and you and this is the end of the journey. It's something that is a fluid process that will always be changing and always be improving. And it, it takes a lot of buy-in, takes um, a lot of work as well uh, to, to, to disseminate the message across colleges, for example, you know, like the Belfast Met, which is a, a significant size um, of, of uh, staff, um, you know, and, and students, a number of staff and students. So um, just encouraging people to, even once you get to the award and we are trying to renew our award after three years now, um, that you don't forget that that is a process that you can always make it better, leave the experience, um, you know, 
are the best examples that you can take from your students um, to be able to then continue to give continuity to that process. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think that's the thing that we always want to encourage is that continued collaboration. I think what's been really heartening is how generous uh, so many colleges have been in terms of sharing what they are doing on a kind of peer to peer or bilaterally. Um, I just note that it looks like is it um, Kaylee has been asked, will the FE award request go through our local groups or is it national? Again, this depends a little bit on the local capacity. So I'm not quite sure which college you're from. Um, uh, and uh, I can check that with you. So some of our groups are uh, have a lot of capacity and a lot of interest in working with FE colleges. And so we, you know, once we know where you're from, we would, you know, check in with a local group. Um, some local groups uh, just don't have as many, you know, volunteers or the capacity, or they're too busy doing other activities. They might not be able to do it. And those are the ones that, in general, that we would manage the entire process. In any case, what we try and do, and we're, you know, we're forever trying to improve that communications loop, is make sure that we are well connected to the local group, as are, as is the college. So whether or not the actual, you know, appraisal process runs through Megan and myself, or whether the local group is running it, that you know, all, all of us are talking quite a bit and that, you know, whatever good practice that uh, you're doing can be then shared in a wider platform. So uh, it's just to say, and, and maybe, oh, it's in Nor uh, Norfolk. Okay, we have very, as you might know, we have a very um, strong uh, Norwich City of Sanctuary group with lots of fantastic uh, talent there. So what we would uh, probably do is just have a conversation with that local group to see about their capacity. Um, but uh, if you drop us an email, we'll can follow up with that local group and kind of ensure. Yeah, it looks like Megan's answered that one. Um, there was a question as well from Nikki. Um, Royal Met is due to have an audit from College of Sanctuary team. How complex is it likely to be? Um, do you want me to jump in and do this one? Or would okay. you that? I'll, I'll, um, I'm tired of my own voice, so please. <laughs> Um, so I would say in terms of the audit, the audit um, is brand new for Colleges of Sanctuary and um, we haven't actually launched it yet. It's not on the website yet, um, but we are going to be sharing it hopefully by the end of this week. Um, now, the reason that we've developed an audit is to help colleges think about the different ways that they can meet the minimum criteria in a really meaningful and holistic way um, and has been developed um, with support from the feedback of, of partners like Refugee Education UK and also drawing on lots of things that we've seen from college that colleges have been doing over the past year and realising that this is hopefully a really effective way to help colleges think about all the different aspects. So the audit is something that we don't need to see. It is purely a tool to help colleges um, think about their own practice and develop. Um, so hopefully it's a tool to help and support you um, rather than us. Um, what we do need to see is the application form. And now if you have a look at the application form, we've got the learn, embed and share um, sections. And within those sections, we then have the minimum criteria. So I really don't want it to be an onerous process. So what I would simply suggest doing is bullet pointing under each minimum criteria um, how, how you have met that. And again, if you look at the audit, this can help um, uh, help you think about the different aspects of practice you're already doing, and then hopefully some that you're, you can develop as part of this journey as well. Um, but yeah, I would I would keep it simple, short and sweet. Um, definitely no uh, you know long sentences. Uh, saves us time and saves you as well. <laughs> great, thank you, Megan. That's great. Um, and yes. So REUK um, has explained yeah, there's some training programs for asylum seekers and refugees. They run, um, you know, some direct support services uh, as well, which is fantastic. Uh, and we help you understand their rights and available resources. Um, yes. OK, so they've shared the, the website. But this is just to say, um, so we have, uh, you know, in the in the course of, of starting this award scheme, we've recognized that it, some of this information out there is it is difficult to find. Um, we did a webinar in spring of, of 2021 where we had a speaker from the Ruth Heyman Trust who was talking about entitlements within the English context because obviously education and uh, funding you know varies between the different uh, nations of the UK. Um, and 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 
so that webinar is on our, our events recording list, um, which we can also we'll drop in the chat. But it's just to say that, yeah, there's a lot of complexity. We know that. And um, it can be difficult to, to, to know. And it's also difficult to help students who, you know, may have qualifications from, a um, you know, from where they've come from. But how do we get those recognized? How do we, you know, find them either the ESOL courses that they need to help them get back to, into the field of study that they want to? You know, how do we maybe offer what might be other venues uh, of, of career opportunities? Um, so uh, I will kind of start to draw it to a close. If there's not, I don't see any more hands coming up. We have recorded the session. So if you've come from a college, we will be sharing that later in the week. Um, and we would be very happy for you to share it with colleagues. Um, Megan and I, our emails are on the website um, and we're always kind of welcome queries if you have some questions. But what we wanted today to, to be about was just try and provide a little bit of that overview of, of the stream and what we're doing um, and, and, and the intent to help FE colleges. So I know everyone's very busy. So I think I will take the fact that there's no more questions um, as a sign that we all need to get back to our desk, perhaps. And, and thank you all for coming here today. I hope you found it useful. Very grateful to hear from uh, Ligia in Belfast. I hope you feel better soon. Uh, and please be in touch if there's anything we can answer or support you with. Thank you for coming. <laughs>